The United States has been at war for well over a decade now, and every year thousands of troops deploy to countries like Iraq and Afghanistan. But what's being done to ensure our bravest and finest are prepared for battle no matter what occurs? We caught up with one of the Army's most storied regiments, the 3rd Cavalry Regiment out of Fort Hood, Texas, here at NTC in Fort Irwin, California. Currently we are in phase three of 1604 rotation to the National Training Center. It's our decisive action rotation in preparation for deployment to Afghanistan. And, uh, reconstitute as the regimental reserve. It's part of a two week rotation that we do out here to train in our specific jobs. Just building a unit cohesion and getting used to doing our jobs in a field setting. Stay inside and away from windows and doors. It is actually my first time out here. I've, I've never been out to California at this location, and it is definitely something, something else. So it's, it's not anything that everybody's used to seeing. We're out here integrating with the Army, trying to provide air power and integrate fires with artillery. And that's where we come into play and provide everything that the Army's requesting so that way they can uh, kill the bad guys, keep all the good guys safe. It's important that we're out here training together so whenever we go downrange, we're on the same page. Fire in the hole, fire in the hole, fire in the hole! Just trying to get out here and do the, the J-O-Bs, sure makes it fun. As the, the squadron executive officer, I'm in a position where I help make the organization run. Organizing and synchronizing not just the staff, but subordinate support structure within the uh, uh, within the organization, so it's kind of the behind-the-scenes guy, the everything guy that, that, that makes things happen. Zero eight, the op order, 1100 car, and then we'll have more to fill out the rest of the timeline. Every day is a little something new, but uh, most of the time it, it involves you know some level of an operation, whether it be in the morning or afternoon, it could be throughout the night. The troops are engaged in combined arms maneuver, where it's a force on force against a, an armored threat or a mechanized infantry threat, or to more of a wide area security type of a mission. Uh, of course, we're doing both of those at the same time, uh, and that's what's unique about the, the uh, National Training Center. The regiment is deployed here to the National Training Center to basically train the regiment in decisive action. What that does is it forces us to actually deploy, so get out of Fort Hood, go to a separate area, deploy into that area, build combat power, and then fight a, a realistic fight in a very large training area. Fighting the Denovian threat, which is what we have, that's the opposition forces here, which is actually the 11th Cavalry. The, the threat is everywhere. The Black Horse, who we fight against, they're a phenomenal fighting organization. They do this every month, and they get really, really good. They'll make, it, they'll make the formation fight hard and challenge us to where we'll get better every time. If they beat us, that's fine. We'll learn, we'll grow, and then when we go out to Afghanistan or wherever else we have to go do missions, then, then we'll beat our near-peer competitor. So, so they're fighting against us, we're fighting against them. Survivability is the key. Here at NTC, it's very dusty, very hilly. The terrain is definitely a little different from anything I've trained in before. When you look at these, these mountains, you get through some of these passes, it absolutely looks like Afghanistan. I think you really get used to just the vehicles maneuvering in a different setting and trying to make do with what you have. 
It's not really liked by all, but it's the most realistic training that you'll be able to get. We're here in the high desert of California. Even though it's February, I'm sweating, uh, it's hot, and then it gets real cold. So we get massive temperature swings. We gotta be prepared for anything. You do get some rain this time of year, which makes it a little slick and muddy. And it, it can be absolutely miserable with the sand and the sun, everything gets on you. The, the living conditions are, are uh, <laughs> rustic at best. NTC is definitely, I think, the epitome of embracing the suck. I was so happy to see a porta potty the other day, and I think that's crazy that I would be so happy about a porta potty, but those are the conditions we're in. I live off of my striker. We're here 14 days in the box, as we call it. My shower, last shower, I think was, uh... I can't even remember, it's that long. So it's, it's been a while. Vegetarian taco, huh? We eat MREs every day. Don't work for meat eaters, man. Nah. It sustains us, it's fuel uh, for the body. We get through, but over time, it, it, it wears on you. Oh, oh, the combat fanny pack, yeah, 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 <laughs> combat fanny pack. I think that as long as you're with good people, you know, we embrace it and we have a good time learning how to do our job in any conditions. So it's a really good simulation of combat where we come in, we're fresh, we've got a lot of energy, and then the environment takes its toll, the, you know, the, the lack of sleep uh, as we move operations takes its toll, so it wears on you. By the end of the rotation, we're, we're going to be exhausted, absolutely exhausted. The National Training Center uh, allows the squadron the opportunity to test all of our systems. All the way from platoon operations through the troops, the squadron, and the regiment for casualties, ammunition resupply, planning operations, syncing all the mission command systems. So it really forces us to get big space, a lot of different terrain, and fast movement in the fight and make all those things connect and work. Really, it's the, one of the only places that we can do that. We continue to try to accomplish the mission, but at what cost? We need to be prepared for the next fight. This allows us the opportunity to train and, and prepare for uh, whatever's next. Rough terrain, unforgiving weather conditions, sometimes spotty communication, and even lack of resources. This is what our soldiers deal with when they're downrange. That's why Fort Irwin and NTC is the perfect place for them to come train for the real thing. The regiment is oldest and most historic uh, units in the Army. Very proud to be part of the 3rd Cavalry Regiment. You know, the, the, there's been a lot of history with it and, the, you know, lo lots of change. This regiment is converted from the Armored Cavalry Regiment, where we had lots of tanks, Bradleys, Apaches, uh, into a Striker Cavalry Regiment. So we're really a, an infantry-centric organization, but we have a cavalry lineage, and, and that history is really important to us. And the history of this regiment goes all the way back to the Mexican War. So you have where Winfield Scott said to the regiment after a main fight at the Chapultepec, you know, you were, you, you were baptized in fire and blood and came out steel. You know, as an infantry officer in this striker cavalry regiment, you know, I get to be a part of that history, and it's, it's, it's quite awesome. So you have us with our motto with, you know, blood and steel. We have IEA, which is uh, the call, which means attack and sue. So we have this long-standing history, but we were created as mounted riflemen. So in our inception, even though we spent a lot of time as the Armored Cavalry Regiment, we, we, we were created under mounted riflemen. So originally they got up on horses, the riflemen went, they dismounted off the horses and then fought as infantry. And that's what the Striker Regiment is. So we're motorized infantry, we ride the Striker to the fight, we dismount, and we fight dismounted. I think as I grow up in the Army, I have much more of an appreciation for where this regiment came from and, and where it's going in the future. And to be a part of it is, is something that's pretty special. Really 
what's key is imprinting the plan on everybody in the formation. Big five and the commanders, you can just get that down and out and we'll get started. We all have a shared understanding of what's going on. So we pitch our operations order on the terrain model. This is the John Wayne foothills and then this is the John Wayne pass. We, we took the troop commanders and I walked them through the terrain. It's a giant terrain model. Oftentimes you may see something a little smaller. We really push it out to where we can walk and they can see the spatial difference and the relationship between each other as they maneuver through. And that really then draws out some of the issues and the problems that, you know, me at two in the morning with the staff just didn't quite see. And we can iron that out on the spot and then the plan is better. And everybody walks away with that shared vision of what's going to happen as we go through. About four kilometers away, so it should only take around 12 minutes uh, to get there via ground Kazovac. So, and, and if anything, you, you, you come through Tiford Spur, if you're out of contact and you're able to continue west along the spur, get in. After that, we have the combined arms rehearsal, which again, looks a lot like the operations pro order process. It basically it becomes a rehearsal for the rehearsal, which then, if, if we have it sequenced right, they then go to the regimental combined arms rehearsal as well. I want to keep that coverage firing. And so now we have three opportunities to imprint the plan on the troop commanders. Be prepared to reinforce Ironhawk or Grimm with additional javelin fires. Uh, we, we really want to be fast, we want to be lethal, and we want to be resilient, to quote the SCOS 3. All the guys we have in there are built to sustain operations as we go through. Strike for Infantry Organization is a fast, moving organization. It's always been a hard-hitting, fast-paced, and lethal organization. What, what we mean by speed and being fast is not just maneuver, but it's in the orders process. To be able to do that, Roger. our operations centers have to be able to break down, move, and set up quickly because that front forward line of troops is moving out at a high rate of speed in, in, against the enemy. We maneuver and fight at the speed of an infantry formation. So there's a challenge in there. We can get to someplace really quick, and then once we're out on the ground, we're a little bit slower, but we get then our weapon systems into the fight. So I run the TAC. I've got fires guys, I've got JTACs guys, I've got my battle captain, I've got my gunner, my driver, I've got a combo guy, and we're all squeezed into this thing, all working off of digital and analog systems. It, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's uh, organized chaos. Every commander is different on how they want to fight. And uh, my squadron commander, he wants to fight fast and forward and talk to the troops via FM. And in order to do that, I had to create a vehicle that gives him that ability to do so because then I've got to push all the information back. So we've got two real mission command nodes. We've got the TAC and then we have the TAC. And the TAC is basically my striker, the commander, and then the Air Force striker that has all the antennas for talking to the air. And what that does is it gives us all a capability. So I can talk via FM, HF, TACSAT, BFT, JCR chats, and then we pull all that together with digital and analog common operating pictures, and I fight the whole fight from that. Let them know that they were going through Brown's Pass. I've outfitted it with a Queens mask that's easy up, easy down, so I can be in and set up and fully function in about 10 minutes. Great rifles. Better, better, better. better. As the orders trickle down from higher, from regiment to us, it's incumbent upon me uh, as the operations officer and staff to take that and work that staff to build a plan fast enough to give time to the troop commanders and the platoon leaders to build their plans. Because at the end of the day, the platoons have to execute. But if the platoon doesn't execute because he didn't have the time to figure out the mission, the intent, and what his key tasks are, then the plan will fail. So we try and buy time for them. Survivability as, is part of the reason to be able to move. What that enables me to do is let the boss go forward and he can talk to his troop commanders and maneuver and fight the fight forward and then I take everything back to me. I process it, I analyze it, and I'm able to keep him with a good situational awareness of what's going on both above us, around us, and to his troop commanders. That's my house. It's also my car. It's also my living room. That's where we have fun, it's where we do our job, and we got to make it good every day.
as a leader here at the National Training Center, you know, it's important for you know, a person in my position to be able to develop the young leaders. Or do you want it after, right? right? So I did mine before, and I got a broadening assignment after that. Too. The most effective way to build teams is to put them in a harsh environment, make them suck together. As a field grade officer in, in the squadron, I have the unique opportunity to develop young uh, officers uh, and non-commissioned officers, for that matter, into better leaders through challenging and situations that the National Training Center provides. Let's go. Let's go. Building those teams, you do it through tough, hard training in those conditions. We learn to love and, and enjoy each other uh, as we go through and we take care of each other. Okay. You know, with your jabs into the valley of death. You know, having the ability to, to bring those young leaders around and wrap your arms around them and say, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's tough. it's tough, it's going to be hard, but here's how we can work together to get through it. And it's all about building the team. Okay, what else, gentlemen? And, and that camaraderie is really up. We're absolutely a tight team. Coordination there is going to be a little more difficult. We use this as an opportunity to develop a team before and, and synergize and get all our systems right before going downrange to whatever it is our, our next mission is going to be. The great thing about our Army and our country is it's an all-volunteer force. I truly believe that anybody can do anything they want in our country, and that freedom is what I'm here to protect. Service to my country is absolutely the utmost driving factor, you know, certainly to my family as well. I've got two girls. In other places, they wouldn't have opportunities. So for me, it's personal, and I want to make sure they can do anything. And if they want to be a soldier, more power to them, they want to be a teacher, whatever their hearts desire, the world is theirs. But if somebody wants to encroach on that freedom, I'm here to make sure that that doesn't happen. I'm half Native American. My own service as a warrior leader, it goes back to being that, that part of me. It's all about heritage, it's all about support for your country, and support for you know, the people that you, that you grow up with and, and you're around. It's your choice. We get a better quality soldier. We get people that want to be here. And that's, that's, that's people I want to be around. At the end of the day, I fight so others don't have to. The experience of NTC is one that won't soon be forgotten. The long nights, longer days, and constant strategizing and moving. But for the men and women in uniform who raise their right hand and pledge to fight and defend our country and protect our freedoms, it's exactly the training and experience they needed before we send them into battle.